Hello, and welcome to Breast Cancer Conversations, a podcast brought to you by survivingbreastcancer.org. I'm Laura Carfing, breast cancer survivor and founder of survivingbreastcancer.org, a nonprofit organization providing community, education, and resources to empower those diagnosed with breast cancer and their caregivers from day one and beyond. Hello to my podcast family, and welcome to another episode of Breast Cancer Conversations. I am always so thrilled to be starting my week off with all of you, and thank you again for tuning in and being such avid listeners. Today, I am so excited to be speaking with Amy Ellen. She is a radiology tech living with metastatic breast cancer, and her story really resonates in the sense that we are not just getting information about what to expect with a scan, whether it is a mammography scan, CT, MRI, or PET, but really actually understanding what those tech radiologists do and how we can partner with them as part of our treatment team. Additionally, because Amy went from early stage to advanced stage breast cancer, she talks to us about living with lobular MBC. We get into the nitty gritty, we go behind the curtain, so to speak, and Amy gives us such rich educational content and really helps us understand what the role of the radiologist tech is, how to understand these technologies, and what we can expect when we get our results. We also ask some of the burning questions I know I had for myself. Why, when I go in for some of this radioactive treatment and scans, can they not access my port? Why do they always have to prick me through my vein in the arms? And so we get into those nitty gritty questions as well. Before we dive into today's podcast episode, I just want to remind you all to follow us on social media. We are on Instagram and Facebook. You can follow us at Surviving Breast Cancer Org, all one word, as well as on Twitter, which is SBC underscore ORG. And then if you haven't already subscribed to our weekly mailing list and getting all of our content, hop on over to survivingbreastcancer.org forward slash events, where you can find our weekly and monthly lineup of programming. Now let's get started. Welcome to the conversation. I am Amy. I um, am from Georgia, but I currently live in New York. I've been here 20 years. My background is in um, diagnostic imaging, which covers from the radiation to MRI, all the different various tests we interact. We're actually kind of like the center of the hospital for all patients. So you come in. And most of the time, you've got to get some type of testing to get answers if you have any kind of clinical diagnosis, whether it be cancer or not cancer. I uh, was first diagnosed in January uh, 29th, 2014 with uh, breast cancer. And at the time, we thought it was like 2A. But then with surgery, we chose a route of double mastectomy. And during surgery, they found lymph node involvement. And my diagnosis soon switched to 3B. I ended up having cancer in both breasts. Um, I have lobular. uh, That's my history and background. Um, I'm hormone positive and HER2 negative. And then five years to the day in 2019, I was diagnosed metastatic, had one lesion on the spine. Um, Same type of cancer, but a little bit different. Mine kind of went around the the hormone blocker that I was on. And so now I'm more um, ER positive and less PR um, positive. My my numbers changed a little bit. And so far, I'm about 37 months outside of the metastatic diagnosis and I'm still on my first line of treatment. But, you know, I'm like everybody else in the metastatic community. You wait for the other shoe to drop, you know, you hope it doesn't. But, you know, that's kind of living. That's how it works. I know, kind of on this like every three month scan timeline, right? And seeing is it working, is it still working? You know, you bring up so many great points just in your introduction. Speaking of lobular breast cancer, can you explain a little bit more about what lobular is? Lobular is generally found in the fat, um, the fatty tissue of the breast, and it spreads a little differently. It normally goes to bones first, but with the lobular diagnosis, that's rare. It's like less than 10% of the community, and most of the time it's just in one breast, not in both breasts. I think it evolves and we learn about it as we go, Um, but most of the people that I interact with, they're ductal and not lobular. So, you know, you're even though we're all in the same community, we're on just a little bit different journey. Oh, absolutely. There's so many nuances, subtypes. I learned all of that once I got diagnosed. 
that it's not just this big umbrella of breast cancer, but there's so many segments of that, um, you know, grade type, the intrinsic subtypes, the hormone receptors, etc. And bringing up the fact that you were on a hormone blocker, were you on tamoxifen or on one of the aromatase inhibitors? So that's where we get a little tricky too. I had um, something that was suspicious on the ovaries when I first started chemo. So I opted when I got done with the IV chemo that first year, we wanted to have a hysterectomy. So I saw a specialist and they took out my ovaries. So I ended up being on, um, oh my goodness, the name slips me, not tamoxifen. I was on postmenopausal, even though I was diagnosed at 39, because mm. I chose to do surgical menopause. Yes. Okay. And I'm, I'm similar. I didn't go through the surgery piece, but I'm on letrozole, actually, one of the aromatase inhibitors. So I started on letrozole and then I switched to nestrozole and then I ended up going back and forth between the two because I had some side effects. Did you yes. ever have like the joint pain? Still and do. Some of that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I tried some different ones as well. And it's kind of like picking the best of all the evils, I guess. Right. Um, still just dealing with it. A lot of Epsom salt baths. <laughs> <laughs> So, but absolutely. And again, being pre-metapausal myself, I have not opted for the surgery just yet, but I am getting a Lupron shot, which suppresses the um, the functions of the ovary. So it does kind of put you into this medical menopause, I call it. Yeah. So, ugh. well, great stories to share. So for those listening, you know, whether you're relating to some of this or all of this or one or the other, you know, I think it's just really great to hear the different experiences and how people are responding to um, their diagnosis, their treatments, and the decisions that they make. We have to remember all of us are individual. I think that's the big thing. Like you can take what other people bring to you and be your own advocate or research yourself. But we have to remember that every one of our journeys are just a little different. Yeah. What do they say? Like not one, not two tumors are identical, right? They're all right. separate. Exactly. And I'm still learning that even being diagnosed about five years ago, you know, the treatments that I had were the best treatments and opportunities at the time and how much the science has advanced. I was just talking to another woman. I was on Cytoxin was one of my IV chemotherapies. She's now taking Cytoxin in an oral pill form. And I'm like, yeah. oh, how much more convenient would that have been? So, you know, we're always constantly learning too. So let's dive into a little bit of today's topic, which is on radiation, um, radiology technology, the technician, diagnostics. Can you give us just a high-level overview on maybe just some of the nomenclatures, the language around what radiation um, or radiation tech is versus the radiation oncology piece, just so we understand like the framework that we're discussing today? Okay, so the technologists in the radiology department, they're either like a diagnostic tech or they could be a nuclear tech or an ultrasound tech. And then on the oncology side, they went to radiology school too, but they pursued a little bit further education. So then they go, they go to diagnostic school. We all, most of us start out as a diagnostic tech. It used to be a two-year program through a hospital. Now it's like four years and it's through a college. You have to do clinical hours similar to nursing, um, but we go and we take classes and then you start out as an x-ray tech and then once you do that, you can specialize in CT or MR. You can go back and do nuclear. Um, ultrasound, they go to a separate school and they go just to ultrasound school. Most of those techs now, they go for a couple of years and they come uh, and they and then they eventually get their four year degree. But for ultrasound, for each body part, they take a different registry for a diagnostic tech. If you do CT, then you take a test for CT to get your license there for MRI, the same thing. Um, and you can specialize like a, in interventional radiology. So everything, there's schooling and there's on-the-job training and clinical hours. Wow. And is this your profession, one of the one streams that you went through personally? Yes. So I... Um, it's funny that I'm in radiology. I had scoliosis as a small child, so I used to get x-rays regularly. So I knew I wanted to do something in the medical field. I always thought it would be cool to be the person to say, hold your breath, breathe, you know. So <laughs> That voice, that so, ominous voice yeah, in the CT scan. Yes. <laughs> yes. So I always thought that that would be kind of cool. So um, I applied to radiology school. I did a hospital-based program uh, about 22 years ago, and then 
I pursued my bachelor's and then I finished my master's last year after Mm. my metastatic diagnosis. I had just started my master's when I got diagnosed and I'm like, I have to finish. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm sure you learned so much on both ends going through it personally and then the textbook side and the clinical piece as well. Yeah. You know what I've learned, I think, is sometimes we forget as techs that it's your test that's going to make a difference. You know what I mean? We're doing 20 or 30 a day, but you're there and that's your one test. And it's going to change the outcome of your, it could change the outcome of your treatment or let you know you're safe. So just think it's a reminder that we need to treat each patient like as a patient, not a number. Yes. And, and I remind myself that of that too, when I go into these appointments, you're absolutely right. Like, you know, we want these people to be part of our care team because for us, it's like, this is the one day I'm going in for a scan or a follow-up. But then you're absolutely right. These people are seeing, you know, 30 patients a day, potentially, sometimes more. Um, And then at the end of the day, they're going home to their own families because this is their profession as well. So, you know, having that level of empathy and understanding and partnership, I think is really important, especially in this field. Yeah, and I think when, as as a patient, when you go, you got to tell them if you're nervous or you, we know our bodies, we're s- stuck for blood work on a routine basis. You know if that's going to work or not work. And as technologists, we have to remember if a patient tells us they know their body better than we do, right? So we mm-hmm. have to listen. And I think the other thing is we need to make sure we're explaining the preps for the different exams. Mm. And I think sometimes... You know, as a patient, your doctor tells you you're going for the test, but if it's the first time, you might not know what it entails. Yes, absolutely. That's so important. Can you give me an example of some of the prep and what's involved in the diagnostics? Okay, so a lot of times when we look at abdominal imaging, because we're looking at the liver and the stomach, they'll have you fast. And it's because if you're having a CAT scan, you might be drinking oral contrast. If you're having an ultrasound, they might have you fasting so that they can see the anatomy better so that stuff is not blocked. Um, For MRI, they have you fast to make sure that they can see all the structures. Sometimes you don't have to fast if we're scanning your brain. You don't have to fast because we can see that. But if they ask you to fast, it could be that the contrast they're going to give you injection or oral could make you a little nauseated. So they're having you fast to try to curb some of those side effects. And is it like a 12 hour or 24 hour fast usually, or does it depend? It depends on what they're looking for. Sometimes they'll tell you don't eat or drink anything after midnight. Mm, You can mm -hmm. have a few sips of water when you're fasting, if it's not for surgery or whatever, that's the fast is more or less taken in sugar or the calories for that. For pet CT, they do have you fast longer. And that's a little different because they're injecting you with the radioactivity. So that's why. And I'm always curious about what they inject you with. So they inject you for those um, CT and MRI scans and PET scans with a radioactive dye that is, in theory, is my understanding that it lights things up if there's like microbolic, no, metabolic activity. Metabolic activity. There you so go. For, the, for the PET CT, they inject you with a radioactive tracer for the bone scan, a radio a radioactivity And those things go to certain types of the body, and that's how they scan you. Um, For CT, they're injecting you with a non-iodinated contrast. But that contrast, it lets lets us see the blood vessels. It lets us see if there's a tumor in there. If the tumor takes on the contrast, that means there's blood feeding the area. Um, In MRI, it's a little different. It's a natural element. Um, We use like a gadolinium-based product. There's no radioactivity in that. MRI uses um, radio waves. It's a magnetic field, and it works off of the water in your body. Um, The noises you hear is uh, when you get into the machine, all of the atoms in your body align with the magnetic field, and those noises you hear are the machine sending signals and gathering data off of the water and the tissue in your body. So, Wow. I'm so glad you broke that down because all I can hear is like, like the big noise. (laughs) So, So. yes. And so a lot of people think that's radioactive. It's not. But MRI is not always your go-to because MRI, we do dedicated areas. Whereas in CAT scan, they can do a large amount of the body in just a few seconds. Like they can do from your chest to your pelvis in less than 10 seconds. So then they get a big overview 
So that's where you start there. And then when you get like, they'll say, hey, I need you to go for a liver MRI. That's dedicated. Then we're just doing images of the liver, whereas the CAT scan looked at the lungs, the bones and all the other organs in the digestive system. Really good point. And that's something I would love to linger on a little bit more. I feel okay. I understand that, you know, the MRI, the CT scan and the PET scans are all three different modalities. Are you able to kind of break that down for us a little bit and explain some of the differences? Because I feel like sometimes we use them interchangeably, but they're actually three separate types of technology being used for different for different outcomes, correct? Yes. So like with the CAT scan, the CAT scan, if you go to the ER and you're sick, a lot of times they'll send you for a CAT scan. That's so they can see a large area. It does use radiation. It's minimal. It's like background radiation. If you have them over and over and over again, then yeah, you are being exposed. That's why they try to spread them out. Okay. Um, the CAT scan, a lot of times in the breast cancer community, we're doing like a CAT scan for the chest, abdomen, and pelvis. And then what we're doing is if you drink oral contrast, the oral contrast fills your digestive tract and it allows us to look at everything, the organs, the lungs, and the digestive tract. Without the oral contrast, they can see it, but not as well because the way everything's wound in into the abdomen and pelvis. And then for PET CT, that's a little more dedicated. You go in and you're injected with the radioactive tracer. Um, it's dependent upon your blood sugar. You don't want to have a high blood sugar for that. That's one of the reasons why they tell you to fast, watch what you eat the week before you go. You don't want abnormal um, results. So for that one, they ask you not to be physically active the day before, mm. you know, like, because if you have a strain or something, it could make something look hot is what they consider like a high uptake and it might not really be something there. But the PET CT, what they do is they scan you in CAT scan and then they'll do the PET CT, which is a nuclear study. And then that's what's masked over the CAT scan. And then that lets them know where the, if you have abnormal activity, where it's over, like if it's over the thyroid or over the liver or the kidneys. And then for MRI, MRI is a little more dedicated. Um, MRI, um, it uses, like I said, it doesn't use radiation. It uses the water that's in the tissue in your body. But in MRI, it has to be a dedicated study. You can't go in there and get your head, your ne- your neck, and your entire spine because each body part takes anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour to scan, depending on what they're looking at. And it's a long time to lay there, and it's very sensitive to motion. Thank you for that overview. So much information to digest. I feel like round two, we might have to meet in person and you walk us through the actual hospital settings and some examples of, of all of this, because it could be really scary to for someone at their very first time to go in and have these scans and you know, even having to deal with some, not just the anxiety, but I know myself too, get really claustrophobic. So needing to be absolutely still and lying down and going into some of these kind of close quarters, so to speak. It's, there's a lot of emotions, I think, that bubble up. I do, because I think it's a reminder of what you're living day to day, too. But it happens, just so you know, it happens in the in a normal setting, too, or in, in a community, you know, when somebody comes in, and they're not certain of what, what we're checking or whatever. And I think it comes from being informed. I don't think the doctor always explains what you're going to walk into either. And I think that's somewhere that I want to advocate that we need to explain or let the patients know what they're walking into. Right, exactly. Do you know why you're here? Do you know what we're testing? How the the process is? And then when they're going to find out their results too, is it going to be in 24 to 48 hours or is it going to be two weeks before you guys can get a read on all of that? I think just having some sort of time frame is also equally important. Well, recently they passed a law where now if you have like my chart, at your medical facility used to your doctor could hold your results, but now your results are immediately available to you once the radiologists have looked at them. And is there any fear with um, results being posted without the context of a doctor um, providing context to the results? I think there is, but I also think we need better access as a patient to our information. You know, HIPAA works when it works to keep your information from going somewhere, but it's also 
a challenge too. Say I go somewhere and get one test and then I end up somewhere else emergently trying to get my information because if the right documents aren't signed, you can't get that information sent. Yeah, no, absolutely. I totally agree. I think sometimes having the more information, the better, sooner, the better. And we can have those follow up calls afterwards. Um, I just feel like they always come in on like a Friday at five, right when everyone goes home. (laughs) Right. So one of the questions that I'm noticing from one of our um, online members, they're asking, and I hear this a lot with regards to the contrast being act. Um, access through the port versus the just IV. And there seems to be a lot of reluctancy around utilizing the port for the contrast for these types of um, imaging. Okay. Can you tell me so, a little bit about that? Yeah. So the one reason they try to stay away from using your port is um, you have to be trained to access the port. So not every nurse or provider is trained. But the other thing is if the contrast is not flushed out, it could cause issues with your port and then your port doesn't work appropriately. That contrast could clog up your port. Mm. They do use it. Like I'm one of those, I'm a very hard stick. So I beg for my port to be used. But the other thing with certain exams, we prefer to do it in your arm, especially if you're having something vascular done, the way it comes into the heart and then is dispersed, it looks it's better for us if we're using your arm. There's not like a bright spot of contrast right where the port is in the chest. I don't know if that answers the caller's yeah. question. Yeah, no, that's, I mean, I think that's a good point too, because now that I'm thinking about it, I always had to go in the um, in the hospital to a separate area to get the port accessed versus just the regular phlebotomy place where you, you know type your name into the little computer screen and they hook you up with the IV. And, you know, I think, part of it too is just like how many times do we need to be pricked and where they're accessing it and all of that like if we could just eliminate one option you know I would say that's a win for us right they do now use um ultrasound guided stuff to start a line and our bodies have been through so much especially if you've had IV chemo so if you know you're a hard stick I encourage you to like make them aware let them know let them know what works like Be vocal about what works for you. And if you find resistance, you can always ask for somebody that's a supervisor or something else. It's about how we go about asking, you know. So I also feel like this is a great opportunity to kind of like go behind the scenes and ask, um, since you are on the tech side, I'm always wondering, like when we go in for scans or any sort of diagnostics or even just regular follow-up, because sometimes that's where they discover things also, unfortunately. Um, I have this new saying where you go to the hospital to get sick because, you know, they're always going to find something for you. But out of curiosity, I'm always trying to read the facial expressions of those people who are administering these types of scans. Can you speak a little bit to like what's going on in your mind when you're seeing patients who you know have cancer or coming through are concerned about progression? Is the treatment working? How how does the body language and the bedside manner, so to speak, play out in, in those situations? Um, we're trained and we really try hard not to give the diagnosis right there at bedside because that's not our place. It's technically the radiologist or your doctor to share but oftentimes the tech does know when they're scanning. If you've scanned and they're seasoned, they know when they see something on the images that there's going to either be further testing or whatever. It, 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 I mean, we see a lot of stuff. I've been scanning over 20 years. So a lot of times I know when I see something. And then for me, it's gut wrenching because I'm like, oh, my goodness, if they're not diagnosed, I know they're going to hear the words. And if they are diagnosed, I'm gut wrenched too, because I know what that's like when you're waiting to see if it's positive or negative or whatever. So yeah, some days, like I feel like I chose a career where I don't feel like I work. I I love what I do. So for me, oftentimes I feel like I'm living my passion. But at the same time, when I have like, I might go a couple of days, I don't scan as much anymore. I help train and I oversee the department. But I do work part time so I can still get the patient interaction. But some days it's hard when you scan somebody and they have no clue, especially if they come in and they've been sick and just lost weight. And then you're like, oh, no, they don't even have an idea. Yeah, exactly. Um, We met a a dear friend at the San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium this 
this December, Abigail and I went in person because we were just clamoring to see people in person post COVID. And um, she was so proud that she lost weight, like she was on a diet. And our first reaction was like, was it intentional? Because you never know in our community. You're like, were you trying to lose weight? Or are you just right. like, <laughs> whatnot? So, you know, trying to just bring humor and light to like the realities that we're living in for sure. One of the topics that we wanted to talk about today also was how we can partner with our um, radiation techs as part of our medical care team. I don't know if you have specific advice for just the general population or those specifically living with metastatic disease that you could share with our community. So I would say, if you have a question, ask the question. If they make you feel rushed, like you're there, you're their priority. Yes, they might be busy. Take the time to ask the question. Make sure that if you think they did something good, tell them, like share with them what worked for you or what didn't. Um, Many of us have had um, breast surgery, so you can't lift your arms or whatever. If they tell you you have to, The reason they're trying to get you to lift your arms is to move them out of the way to get better images. But if you can't, the test can still be done. So just remember, there's more than one way to do something. And even though they're the tech and they're doing it, it doesn't mean that we're always right. I think that's the thing we have to focus on. Yes, that's our job and our expertise. So when we're explaining, you're trying to be helpful. But I also think we have to take the time to hear our patient, too. You know, it's a two-way conversation. I remember um, just going in for an annual mammogram. I had a lumpectomy, and so I'm still getting mammograms. And obviously that hurts because there's so much scar tissue still left and everything. And I remember the the woman on my way out was like, good luck with everything. And I'm like, good luck because it's the rest of the day. Good luck because she knows what's going to happen. I was reading so much into like, what do you mean good luck? Do I need luck? (laughs) So I think we're always looking for kind of, reading in between the lines to understand what is happening. Um, but to your point, I I didn't want to leave the rest of my day like that. So I actually asked her, like, I'm sure you're just saying that because you say that to everybody, like, have a great day, best of luck, et cetera. Um, but, you know, just not letting, not letting myself walk out the door, feeling that level of anxiety and concern. So whether it's beforehand in positioning or afterwards, um, to really have those conversations with, with your team members. So I appreciate that. So that's what brings me to a thing. I used to always say, I'm coming in to get you off the table and you're free to leave. But then I was scanning inmates. So I was telling the inmates, you're free to leave and they're not really free to leave. But it's to your point, good luck. I think we're just trained to say something that's positive and and good luck in our world. I mean, I guess as a tech, it really doesn't mean the same as it does being a patient, right? So if it's said to you, maybe bring it to their attention because you're probably not the only person feeling that. Yes, yes. Good point there, too, with like the lexicon and the language really does matter. Absolutely. Now, have you noticed a difference in your personal practice and profession in this work since your diagnosis? I feel like I've always tried to treat patients, but I've been a patient since I was a child. So I feel like I'm a little different. I do feel like I'm more patient with some things than I was before because I didn't understand the anxiety with the scan, treat, and repeat. But that part I'm better with. But then there's days when I'm not better. When somebody comes in and they're not really hurt and they act as if they are, then I'm a little frustrated because I'm like, there's other people out there living. You know what I mean? That come in there and they're out they're They're different with us too. Switching gears from MRI, PET, and CT, let's talk about mammography and why does it hurt so much? The, the reason that the mammo sometimes hurt, it shouldn't like leave you bruised and stuff, but they have to have a certain amount of compression to be able to get the breast tissue displayed appropriately. Many places now have 3D, so that overreads too, but it's super important that if you go somewhere, make sure you bring outside images So you have a comparison. Another thing to remember is if your scan says this month it's 0.5 centimeters by one centimeter, and then in three months it says 0.7 centimeters and one centimeter, if two separate people read it, it could be the exact same measurement, but each of our eyes are a little different. So we might measure it a little different. It's when you have extreme growth. So if you see a report and there's minor changes, Don't get excited yet. Go back to the oncologist and talk to them 
or ask for an overread. We discussed this a lot on our Monday night group. The ladies will get something and they don't understand or whatever. You can always ask for an addendum or a second look or even a second opinion. So that's something to make sure that you're aware that you have the option for. I did not know that. That's really helpful to know. And does the breast density play a role in this? I know we're talking about mammography, but yes. you know, really trying to go and advocate for whether it's an ultrasound or an MRI if the tissue is really dense. Yes. So some places the practice used to be that if you had dense breast tissue and they were watching, they would do um, a mammography. And then six months later, they would do an MRI. An MRI is very detailed. It does some 3D imaging. You get about 3,000 images with that, but it also shows um, the nodes under the arm sometimes where MAMO, they might see them, but only if they're calcified. Um, I think what it's important to remember is make sure you're doing your follow-up testing. You know, like if they say get one, it's one thing if you missed a month or whatever, but don't like skip, keep up with your testing. The other thing is we talked about the technologist, but it's um, important for everyone to know that radiologists are trained too. They can read general radiology. Most of them read x-rays and stuff, but a lot of times somebody specialized will read the PET CT or the MRI and they don't just read like an MRI. You have like a neuroradiologist, which is like neurological stuff, the brain and the spine. And then you have neuro, um, musculoskeletal that, that a different rad will read those, but they also um, ask each other to help, you know, like if someone's on call, sometimes the delay in getting your report is because they're covering the ED as well. So it might take a day or two, but generally it shouldn't take them more than a day or two to read unless the specialist is off. That would be sure. where the delay would be. Yeah, it's good insight to kind of know what's going on behind the scenes. Um, and it's not always bad news that we're waiting on. <laughs> right. Yes. And so how are you doing now? What What's, if we can talk about maybe some of your personal experiences, the type of scans that you're getting and how you're doing with your treatment? So since I'm lobular, I'm generally a CAT scan and a bone scan. Um, this next round of scans, I'm going to get a PET scan, but I haven't had a PET scan in like two years because the lobular, that's not necessarily the gold standard just because of how mine spreads. And other things, but I have been doing well. But with every twinge, your pain, like I get nervous too. I'm just like Absolutely. the average person, even though I'm there, I have anxiety about going, even though I perform those tests daily. It's different when you lay down on that table versus when you're helping yeah. somebody with the scan. 100%. And you mentioned that you identified the um, progression when it became metastatic due to a lesion on your spine. What type of symptoms um, did you have? Was it back pain that you went in for or was it a I random did. test? So I had some back pain and then um, my cancer, my tumor markers, they just moved minutely. My doctor uses some of the blood work marks or markers like the CA-123 and stuff. She, she does some of those blood work, but it moved just a little bit and I had had a little bit of pain. So I went in and I had like a CAT scan and then I had a scope and I was okay. And then over the next month, if I stood for a long period of time, I felt pressure. So then I went in and had a chest, abdomen, and pelvis CAT scan. And then they saw the lesion and then I had to have a bone biopsy. And then, you know, I'm just like everybody else in the waiting game where you have one test and then you wait a couple of weeks and then you have something else and then you wait a couple of weeks. Yeah. So... But you're in your first line of treatment, and yep. what are you what are you on right now? I'm on Ibrance, and then I do faz the Fazlodex injections. I wish they could make those oral. Um, so I do Ibrance and Fazlodex. I started out on 125, but my blood work, um, my white count stay down. So and then the A and my A and C stay slow. So now I'm on a hundred of Ibrance. Um one of those things when it's working, you don't want to change or adjust your dose, but I, I didn't have any choice due to the blood. Sure. Work. sure. No, that's interesting. My doctor, my primary care now is um, just refers to me as like, you're just a special case all the time. I remember going in for um, a persistent cough again, could be allergies. It wasn't COVID. It was just a persistent cough. Um, and instead of just like prescribing, you know, 
the um, you know cough syrup or cough medicine, she was like, we're just going to go and have you have a chest x-ray. And I'm like, really? Like that serious? I didn't know you go from like zero to 100. But again, just because I think she wants to be proactive with absolutely everything. Um, and and I'm not worried, knock on wood, but even tomorrow I'll share with the community. Um, I'm going to see a liver specialist as well because there was some uptake in enzymes in my liver. So, you know, just one of those things where I just keep telling myself, you know, it is what it is. I'm the special case. They'll just refer me to the specialist all the time now. That's just part of the practice. And and we just hope for the best. So, But some of your liver enzymes, isn't it because the amount of how long have you been on treatment? Because the treatment affects your liver. It does. And so that's actually what I'm interested in talking to him about. So I've been on the aromatase inhibitor and the um, Lupron shot now since 2018. So 18, 19, 20, almost five years. Four right. years, um, plus the the number of chemotherapies that I was on prior to is just like you know the proactive try and kill everything process. So I'm sure my liver is a little angry about all the toxins that are in my body. So we'll find out more about that tomorrow. <laughs> so are you nervous or you're not nervous? Right now, I'm not nervous because I'm just like, gosh, I have to take off work and now I have to go there and find parking. Like my head is kind of like wrapped around about the annoying piece of it. But I'm sure after having the conversation with the doctor and how that conversation goes, um, we'll see. Best of luck to you. I hope Thank it's you. nothing. Thank you. I mean, and then this is crazy because I don't think that's one thing I don't think they tell us as a community. You learn it as you meet the other women is all the side effects or as they, you know, what they call them. Yes. But it's just crazy what it does to everything else in your body. Yeah. So have you experienced or heard of other women who have developed like fatty liver because of the toxicity that, of treatment that they're on? I live it. So you do? I live okay. it, but yeah. So I've tried different diets. That doesn't matter. I've tried other things. My no, my numbers, sometimes they're up, sometimes they're down, but I have a very fatty liver. Mm -hmm. And it's from it's from the, all the treatment and stuff. Yeah, I did ACT is what I did for my IV chemo. And it was like eight months long. Like I did um, dose stents. And then right after I got out of that, I had to do bilateral chest radiation. So I think that did it too. It was like a year of treatment. Yeah. And speaking of that with the... Um... Yeah, I call 2017 my treatment year. And then um, 2018 is when I'm on like the maintenance drugs. But even you were mentioning with the radiation too, the toxicity to the heart. Um, you know, I, I've added um, a cardiologist oncologist into my back pocket now too. Again, just to be proactive with the longer term side effects of of the treatments that we're on. So Yeah, you know... And I, I live somewhere I can get into the city, but my oncologist came from Sloan and she's in our area, which is like 70 miles north of the city. But I think about it. What about the women that are in the rural communities that don't have the same resources or know what questions to ask? They don't even know who to go to. So I hope yes. like as I advocate, I'm able to figure out how to reach the smaller little communities. Absolutely. And, you know, with people online and just having conversations like this is helpful. We can definitely partner. I'm putting together um, FAQs, things that we can share, getting out to even just some of the general practices, because again, a lot of times in these rural communities, they don't have a breast cancer specialist oncologist. You know, the oncologist might be overlooking um, two or three different types of cancers, et cetera. Right. So definitely help, more than happy to help work with you on that and, and get the information where it's needed. I look forward to that. Yeah, definitely. Well, thank you all so much. This has been wonderful. Is there, I know this isn't like live, live per se, but I'm just looking through the questions. There's a lot of people on social media. So I appreciate all of you guys um, commenting and resonating with our conversation today. As I mentioned earlier, we're going to be continuing with our kind of like every other Sunday series where we're going to be bringing on experts who um, are either living with metastatic disease or treat those who are living with metastatic disease to answer your burning questions. So I really appreciate this, Amy. It was such a pleasure getting to know you Thanks. and meeting you virtually. And because you're in New York and I'm in Boston um, and we have a lot of friends in the New York area, I definitely would love to come see you in person. So we'll thank you, have everything. To get together in person. Yes. For sure. Well, thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful evening, and we thank will you. log off. 
Thank you for tuning in and listening to our podcast. If you would like to find out more about our organization and upcoming events and ways to connect, you can find out more by visiting our website at survivingbreastcancer.org. I would like to acknowledge that all of the information on our podcast is from personal experiences and it is not a substitute for professional medical advice. You should always consult your medical care team. If you're looking for specific topics or would like to be a guest on our show, feel free to contact me directly at laura at survivingbreastcancer.org. And of course, we have a couple social media handles you can follow us at as well. For example, Surviving Breast Cancer Org, all one word, as well as our podcast specifically, Breast Cancer Conversations. Until next time, keep on thriving.